Mr. President, I'm very curious about what it's like for you, your life. You know, you're, no one's gone through what you've gone through. Nobody in human history has really, and I know you have supporters, uh, friends, family, they say it's lonely at the top. And I'm actually curious, is it ever lonely for you? I mean, no one can fully relate to what you've been through and what you're going through. Are you ever lonely? So I was, over the years, I love history, I study history. And I was always told that Andrew Jackson, as a president, was treated the absolute worst. He was just really lambasted. And I heard Abraham Lincoln was second, but he was in a thing called the Civil War, so you can understand that. But Andrew Jackson was really, really treated badly. In fact, his wife died during the process. I mean, a lot of people say she died because of the way they were treated. I mean, she was heartbroken and, and broken in so many other ways. and. I heard that for years, and I look now, even last night I was saying it, I said, there's no, I don't care, Andrew Jackson or anybody else, nobody has, when you think of the, the fake things, nobody's been treated like Trump in terms of badly. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's definitely true. There is some truth to that, Willie Geist. Um, it's hard for me not to also look at the person asking the questions. I mean, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? These networks that are promulgating Trump's lies, and I'll keep it serious, I'm not gonna make fun of people or whatever, but it is creating a whole level of lies that people are swallowing whole because they think that's news. They think those are facts. And that's the part that's sad. I mean, it's pathetic that Donald Trump parallels himself to Abraham Lincoln and anybody else. Uh, but it's more pathetic and truly pathetic that our democracy is on the line, because if that guy becomes president, uh, look at his last house guest. And that's our country. Yeah, I mean, that's pure North Korean state media, that kind of interview. Why are you treated so badly? Why are you so great? Why are, Why are so people great? so mean to you? <laughs> also, another thing happened to Abraham Lincoln that former President yeah. Trump didn't get to when he's assessing who was treated worse in terms of Just badly. Just leave that which, right there. Yeah, yeah, we'll leave that right yeah. there. But yeah, leave that I mean, right there. But yeah. to your, your more serious point is, is a good one, which is there are all yeah. kinds of media outlets friendly to Donald Trump whose audiences are receiving that message, the one you saw. They're not receiving messages about his stolen documents. They're not receiving messages about his attempts to overturn the election in 2020, all the legal trouble mm -hmm. in front of him that we're about to talk about. Uh, they're hearing that. And so you have a not a majority of the country, but a large swath of the country that is taking what you just saw there as news. Right. Exactly. Uh, and uh, there's a lot going on, actually, with Donald Trump that they might want to consider, but they'll probably never hear about, or at least in terms of facts. A big day for Trump's legal issues. Former President Trump is expected to be in court today for a hearing in the federal classified documents case against him. In Fort Pierce, Florida, U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon is set to hear arguments on two of Trump's motions to dismiss the charges against him. The first argues Trump was allowed to store classified documents in unlocked rooms at his club under the Presidential Records Act. So this he claims was all good. <clears throat> the second motion claims the man, the main statute used to form charges against the former president is unconstitutionally vague. In, an, in, in that interview yesterday with the right wing network Newsmax, Trump defended his actions. I took him very legally and I wasn't hiding them. We had boxes on the front of the, and a lot of those boxes had clothing and a lot, we're moving out, okay? Unfortunately, we're moving out of the White House. I had the right to do it, in my opinion, and in my lawyer's opinion and everything else. Let's bring in former litigator, MSNBC legal correspondent, Lisa Rubin. Lisa, good morning. Good morning. Apologies for putting this to you again because we've addressed this a thousand times. The Presidential Records Act. Yes. Does it cover what Donald Trump did? It does not cover what Donald Trump did. Really, there's a definition in the Presidential Records Act for what could count as personal and what is presidential. Donald Trump's argument is effectively, it's presidential if I classified it as such in my mind, and everything in my mind was personal before I left. I'm sorry, it's personal if I say it so in my mind, and everything in my mind that I took with me was personal. Therefore, there can be no criminal prosecution against me. Right. So 
Again, apologies for making you answer that question for the 1,000th time, but we'll keep doing it as long as Donald Trump makes that argument. Um, so more broadly speaking, this classified documents case, where where are we? We're hearing about Judge Cannon and some delays, delays. Where are we in this progress of actually bringing this to trial? Well, you'll remember that a couple weeks ago, Judge Cannon had a hearing where she took argument from both sides about when this case should be tried. She has yet to issue a scheduling order setting a trial date. And in the meantime, she is hearing argument today on two motions to dismiss. I'm not a betting person. I'd probably make a miserable one. But the fact that she hasn't set a trial date and yet has set oral argument on two motions to dismiss makes me think maybe she thinks she could get rid of this case entirely without having to set a trial date. And that really is a frightening prospect, I think, given the gravity of the charges here and the panoply of evidence that supports those charges. So what should we, what's going to be the state's defense then? What, what will we hear from them today if they try to counter what Judge Cannon may or may, as to your theory, maybe looking to just make the whole thing go away? What's their argument going to be? I think their argument is going to be, first of all, that the Presidential Records Act doesn't support the interpretation and almost the perversion that Donald Trump is trying to give to it. That the Presidential Records Act would hold that any number of the things Donald Trump took with him are inherently presidential. They should have gone to the National Archives. There was a process to follow that the people in the White House surrounding Donald Trump were well aware of that process and in communication with the National Archives before he left the White House, let alone in a new process that started months afterwards when the National Archives brought to their attention, hey, we're missing a bunch of stuff. That includes the Kim Jong Un letter, the letter Barack Obama left for you, et cetera. And that kicked off a process, basically a cat and mouse game where the National Archives and then the Department of Justice and the FBI were chasing after Trump to collect all the things that he took. And as you well know, he was not honest with them at any step of that process. He, in fact, deluded his own lawyers, Christina Bob, Evan Corcoran, sort of suckered them into it by having the boxes moved in this bizarre three-card Monty that he was playing with his own legal team. I don't think that'll hold up. In terms of the unconstitutional vagueness of the statute here, he's talking about the willful retention of national defense documents. He says among other things, that the phrase national defense is unconstitutionally vague. He says that the unauthorized retention is another aspect of what's unconstitutionally vague here. We all know that this statute has been used to prosecute many other people of lesser stature in this country who have never made such an argument, let alone have a court sustain it. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because you know, you've recently a National Guardsman in Massachusetts. Yes. I believe you got 21 years. 21 years sure. in prison, yes, because of what he did, which granted was pretty egregious, but at the same time shows that this classified, the classification system is completely broken, reality winner. How can, with a straight face, in nothing will happen to Donald Trump when what he did was equally egregious in terms of the crimes of these other low-ranking very low-ranking soldiers and defense contractor. At least we see that all around us, right? We see that in the federal election interference case, too, where 950 people have been sentenced and convicted for crimes associated with January 6th when the instigator-in-chief remains free from trial right now. It's no different here. Donald Trump is immune to arguments that other people are doing time for the same things he has done, and in many cases, he has done worse. So, Lisa, I'm curious. I understand this is, this is the reality. This is the process. This is the judge that we have in this case. Um, but if Trump is not held accountable for taking classified documents into his possession to his club and leaving them in open boxes, claiming they are his, um, getting his workers to be involved in what is ostensibly a crime, um, What's the precedent that that will set if somehow he skates from this? I think it's a terrible precedent, Mika, which is why people like me are so concerned about the rule of law uh, and its survival in the post-Trump and during Trump era. The notion that a former president can escape to their private residence with boxes upon boxes of hundreds of classified documents or documents that otherwise affect the national defense, lie about it, enlist maintenance workers and valets oh in God. that crime, expect them to take the fall and then walk away scot-free and then potentially get elected to the office again, 
That's unfathomable. And not just take the documents, but obstruct, obstruct, Correct. obstruct all the attempts yes. to have those yeah. recovered as well. I'm really struck by the clip you guys played of Greg Kelly interviewing him where he said, <laughs> no one's been treated worse than Trump. I'd flip that around and say, no one has treated us worse than Trump has treated us. He's, he's skating mm -hmm. on this. We'll see if that continues. He'll be in court in Florida today trying to get this dismissed. Although it's not official until the conventions this summer, a Biden-Trump rematch is on the horizon for November. NBC News projects both men won enough delegates to officially lead their parties in the fight for the White House this fall. And as the race heats up, Trump has been sticking to familiar attack lines about President Biden. Joining us now with a fact check is former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner. He's got it all in charts. We'll start, Steve, with the issue of crime. Take a look. We are a nation where free speech is no longer allowed and where crime is rampant and out of control like never, ever before. The carnage line. He's always going with the carnage, Steve. Is it true? Well, no. Crime is not out of control like it's ever been before. And in fact, crime is actually continuing to drop under President Biden. So let's take a look at violent crime. This is per 100,000 people in relationship to our uh, size of our population. And you can see that violent crime actually since 2020 has dropped by 15 percent. 339, 339 violent crimes per 100,000 people. It's below any place it was during the Trump administration, and it's had this huge drop in 2023. The same is basically true of property crime. You can see here, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, people robbing homes and things of that mm -hmm. like, down 7%, 1,830 per 100,000 people. So this is a complete fiction that crime is up under the Biden administration. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, there are different areas of the country experiencing different things and a mixture of crime and homelessness is very personal to people in their neighborhoods. Um, but again, you can't deny the data and the trends that we're seeing. There's also Donald Trump's false claims when it comes to President Biden's energy policy. Listen to this. On day one of our new administration, we will end Biden's nation wrecking War on American energy. He's wrecking the energy business. Ah. Uh. Okay, Steve Ratner, again, what are the facts? Yeah, I mean, wrecking the energy business. So we have had record energy production under the Biden administration. This combines nuclear, fossil fuels, and renewables. And you can see here that we have never had energy production this high. And then the other thing that he says is that he's going to make us energy independent again. Well, the fact is we are energy independent. We've been energy independent now for five years. And in fact, our energy exports... Uh, mostly oil, but also some natural gas hit a record last year. So, in fact, America has we, we produced more oil than any country in the world has ever produced uh, in history. Yeah. And he talks a lot about the economy and how it's, it was better under him and uh, also attempting to rewrite history on the deficit and debt. Listen to Donald Trump. We were going to pay off debt. We were going to reduce taxes further. We gave you the biggest tax cut in the history of our country, bigger than the Ronald Reagan tax cut. Wow. Uh, the actual numbers show something very different, right, Steve? Yeah, he did give us a big tax cut. That part is true. But, yeah. but what yeah. it did was it actually increased the deficit. So when he says that we were on track to pay off the debt, look what happened to the deficit even before COVID. Even before COVID, because of his tax cut, the deficit was going up, up, up. And then, of course, COVID hit. And under Biden, he's actually brought it down. And in his new proposed budget, he would bring it down further. And so because of that huge deficit, when he talks also about how he was going to pay off the debt during his first term, he, in fact, added more debt than any other president in history. Some of it, yes, was COVID, $3.6 trillion. But there was also $5 trillion of debt that had nothing to do with COVID. And, and Trump signed a whole series of spending bills that increased our spending by over two and a half trillion dollars. So the idea that he was a president that was going to attack the deficit and debt problem is actually completely false. And, and Steve, when President Biden put out this week uh, his projected budget, there was a lot of pearl clutching from Republicans about adding to the deficit when they were completely 
silent for the most part as Donald Trump added eight trillion dollars to the deficit. Uh, the chart directly behind you on the, the war on energy, the one you talked about a minute ago, Donald Trump has been posting drill baby drill quite a bit lately. Is it fair to say that sounds more like an endorsement of what Joe Biden's doing right now? Yeah, I, I, this drill baby drill stuff I find astonishing <laughs> because uh, obviously you only get record energy production by by drilling and we have been drilling. Obviously there are concerns about fossil fuels. We need to transition away from them. But for now we need them. And the idea that Biden has been anti-energy or somehow curtailed our drilling is completely blind by the fact that we are producing record amounts of oil and natural gas. So, uh, Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner, thank you. The only problem I see here, and this is not a joke, is that we could do our entire four-hour show fact-checking everything Donald Trump says, and we would not even scratch the surface. That's the problem that we're confronting in this election and for this country moving forward. Steve, thank you. Robert F. Kennedy says... He will announce his vice presidential pick on March 26th at an event in Oakland. Why are we telling you this in a sports segment? Well, because a source tells NBC News the independent presidential candidate has offered the slot to an individual, and that individual has accepted the offer. Mm. Earlier this week, oh Kennedy Jr. confirmed to the New York Times New York Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers and former Minnesota Governor Jesse the Body Ventura were on his short list. This can't be real, right? It's just he's floating these names for fun. It's Aaron <laughs> Rodgers, who is a active member of the New York Jets, is fully expected to return uh, yes. this season. Would he be on the campaign trail during the weekend playing football on Sundays? I, uh... <laughs> I just want to attack this from the perspective of a Jet fan, because I have lots of takes about just what this means. Why is RFK uh, cornering the market on 9-11 conspiracist Democrats in scare quotes? Like what? Oh, he, he wants um, he wants to have the Sandy Hook Democrats, that demo. Right. So that's the story that came out, of course, yesterday, which is that Aaron Rodgers happens to be a guy who told CNN uh, after they identified themselves as a reporter, Pamela Brown, uh, that whole thing was a conspiracy. That was the reporting. So I say all of this to say, if I'm a Jet fan, how do I feel? And so even beyond the human horror of what that means, that conspiracy in specific, like, is that, is that still a line we can't cross? We'll find out, I guess. I think about football. After all that, I think about this is the guy who said we need to eliminate off-field distractions. Aaron Rodgers is the same human being who had those words exit his mouth. And now to be the first athlete in history to mount a presidential, vice presidential campaign is just one of those on the nose things that you would laugh at if you also didn't worry about what it says about, I don't know, uh, democracy and ourselves. Kennedy and Rodgers, of course, first bonded over their vaccine skepticism, denialism. The new report that Pablo just referenced is from CNN highlighting the conspiracy theory allegedly shared by Aaron Rodgers about the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting not being real. I mean, this is Alex Jones stuff. It's disgusting. It's appalling. Pamela Brown, one of the reporters behind the piece, said she was introduced to Rodgers while covering the Kentucky Derby back in 2013. And upon hearing that she was a journalist with CNN, Rodgers immediately began to attack the news media for covering up important stories, he said. According to the report, Rogers brought up the Sandy Hook shooting, claiming it was actually a government inside job and the media was intentionally ignoring it. Brown recalls Rogers asking her if she thought it was off that there were men in black in the woods by the school. We're not going to even get into this stuff. Rogers, through one of his agents, declined to comment to CNN in response to this. CNN had a second source on this. He's been saying this to a whole bunch of people. It's arguably the most disgusting conspiracy theory in all of the QAnon Alex Jones world that that has descended on this country in the last decade or so. So I guess, John, the question for me is, at this point, if you're the New York Jets, Aaron Rodgers is a broken down 40 year old who won one Super Bowl a decade and a half and ago. Same number of Super Bowls as Jeff Hostetler, <laughs> Brad Johnson, Trent, Trent Dilfer, Nick Foles. Is it worth it to have this guy? By the way, you got an awful lot of Jets fans in Newtown, Connecticut, I promise. And let's remember, Aaron Rodgers, his play was already slipping at the end of his time in Green Bay. He played all of four plays last year before he was injured, suffered a major Achilles tendon injury. We don't know how he'll bounce back this year. And that's just the football context. The 
it is the most loathsome conspiracy theory out there. And if he believes it, then he's a loathsome human being. He also, we know from his former teammates who have said, told people that he would float 9-11 conspiracy yep. theories too, that he believes December 11th was an inside job. So that might be the second worst conspiracy theory in American society. Uh, Pablo, I just, I don't see how the New York Jets can employ this guy. If this is, this is real, let him go, let him go be Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s running mate. They'll lose in embarrassing fashion. Don't let him play for your team again. Yeah. Can I just posit that this guy doesn't really care about football anymore? Can I just say that? Like, it should be insulting for Aaron Rodgers to hear someone say that about him, but every indication is that he wants to talk about and complain about and be victimized by and become a messianic figure because of alleged cancellation. And why? Is it us, Aaron, or is it you? And for Aaron Rodgers, the answer is never Aaron Rodgers is the problem, despite all the people around who are voting in the other direction. And by the way, those Sandy Hook families have suffered for more than a decade yes. because of that conspiracy. Yes. They've been harassed. They've had to move. It's insane. They've had to dis not disclose awesome. where their children are buried. It's the most horrific thing. And if Aaron Rodgers is really talking about this, I don't know how the Jets keep. Now you got Tyrod Taylor. He's a starter. Let him be the quarterback. ESPN's yep. Pablo Torre. Thanks, Pablo. Great to see you. Thank you, Pablo. Coming President Donald Trump is expected to be in court today for a hearing in the federal classified documents case against him. In Fort Pierce, Florida, U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon is set to hear arguments on two of Trump's motions to dismiss the charges against him. The first argues Trump was allowed to store classified documents just like this. Unlocked rooms at his club under the Presidential Records yeah, Act, he claims... This was okay, that right is, by the that, potty. Yeah, not, not, a, not okay, and we'll see if the judge, who I guess desperately wants to be appointed by something else by Donald Trump, will make the mistakes she made before and then yeah. get absolutely excoriated uh, by the 11th Circuit. So we'll see. She can rule what she wants to rule, but no court will uphold uh, such a preposterous argument. The second motion claims the main statute used to form charges against the former president is unconstitutionally vague. In an interview yesterday with the right wing network Newsmax, Newsmax, Trump defended his actions. I took him very legally and I wasn't hiding them. We had boxes on the front of the, and a lot of those boxes had clothing and a lot, we're moving out, okay? Unfortunately, we're moving out of the White House. I had the right to do it, in my opinion, and in my lawyer's opinion and everything else. Mm. That interview was uh, yeah. fantastic. Just not true, just not true what he said. Let's bring in uh, attorney George Conway. Hey, George, um, so let's just say that Donald Trump accidentally uh, packed his golf shirts and his golf shoes and some classified documents and took it down, uh, discovered it, and then said, hey, I've got these things. You guys need to have them back. No harm, no foul. They would have come to get them. Get they would have taken them back. Why, in fact, that's exactly what happened in Joe Biden's case. Here, doesn't matter what he says on Newsmax or Fox, here he had the documents. He knew he had the documents. He lied to the FBI about the documents. They tried negotiating to get the documents back. He gave some of them back. In fact, he had his lawyers actually sign affidavits swearing all the documents were back and ended up they were lying. He kept more documents. He then tried to get his IT guy to destroy uh, the evidence. The IT guy refused. Uh, he then asked uh, someone else to flood the IT room uh, with water from the swimming pool. That guy refused as, as well. They are now testifying against Donald Trump. So for all the idiots out there, are, are let, let me say not idiots, all those who have been brainwashed and are now in Donald Trump's personality cult, mm -hmm. who are immune to facts, who are immune to the truth, or immune to what's right and what's wrong in this situation, uh, clarify for them, if you will, George, the difference between those two scenarios. I think you just did it. Uh, but it, <laughs> what Trump is arguing is, as you say, absolutely preposterous. I mean, he's arguing, first of all, that the, the records belong to him under the Presidential Records Act. Literally, the Presidential Records Act stops, starts 
by saying precisely the opposite, that official papers of the president belong to the United States of America, and the president can have certain rights to look at those papers after the fact, but they have to go through uh, the National Archives. And none of that, you know, has anything to do even with the classification. The classification issue is something that doesn't affect the fact that he took these documents and then squirreled them around. But it, and, and, the, the, and there's no argument that this is somehow unconstitutionally vague. I mean, he obstructed justice. There's just no question about that. People go to jail for that all the time. And there's no question that these materials uh, contain national defense information. Even if he could pull the Karnak, the magnificent routine, uh, routine with an envelope to his head and say these are declassified, they'd still be uh, national defense information under the Espionage Act, and that and each of those counts subjects him to a potential of ten years in jail, and there are just dozens of well, counts. Wait. So he, yeah. he said, he, uh, yeah. Well, I was going to say, George, what's most telling here is, and again, Donald Trump has done so many things throughout the process just to <laughs> undermine, to gut every one of his arguments. That whole argument of, well, I could declassify these if I want to, of course, undermined by his statement to his campaign manager when he was showing her top secret uh, invasion plans of Iran, saying this is classified material. Uh, if oh. I uh, were still president, I could declassify it and then I'd have no problem showing everybody in the room this. But I'm not president anymore, so I can't declassify these materials. So, again, even that claim is a bogus claim. He can't be Karnak the the magician, he can't be Trump, the all-powerful ex-president. He broke the law. He knows he broke, he broke the law. He admitted he broke the law. That's absolutely right. It's an open and shut case with all the witnesses against him talking about how, telling the prosecutors and the grand jury about how he hid the documents and lied about the documents, had his lawyers lie about the documents, tried to destroy the evidence, and so on and so forth, as you've mentioned. I mean, that's all, that's just devastating evidence. And it's not a complicated case. Yes, there is sensitive national security information in those documents, but the precise content doesn't matter. And that's, that's the reason why this case isn't that complicated. There isn't some kind of, it, it just, it's just like a drug bust case. You basically, he had the drugs, he, I mean, the documents, people saw him with the documents, he hid the, do he hid the documents, and, you know, it, the evidence was in his office and in his bathroom and in his ballroom at his own private resort. It's just, this case should have, should be going to trial right now, frankly, if were it not for the bizarre actions of this district judge at the very beginning who tried to, to hamstring the Justice Department's investigation and the grand jury investigation. It had to get slapped down by the U.S. Court of Appeals in Atlanta twice. I mean, if it weren't for that and, and if it weren't for other delays, I mean, this case, any other judge, I think, would have had this case tried or ready to be tried as of now. Meanwhile, as President Biden tours the Midwest in an attempt to shore up his support there, the Laborers International Union of North America has a new ad out endorsing him. Politico's Playbook this morning had a preview of the new ad. Let's take a look. We're up in West Branch, Michigan. We have a lot of hunters out in the woods. Many of these people are laborers who support Joe Biden. People have an opportunity to work and put food on the table, and that's through President Biden's infrastructure dollars. He's bringing manufacturing back to the Midwest. All of a sudden, we're getting chip factories, battery factories, and that's because of the Democrats and President Joe Biden. Roads, bridges, everything's getting rebuilt. The out-of-work list is completely empty, and it's been empty for a good year and a half now. Everything's just booming. Hunters. That is a uh, strong ad. Let's bring in right now White House correspondent for Politico and co-author of The Playbook, Eugene Daniels. Eugene, tell us about the ad. Yeah, I mean, if you watched that, as you just did, and you just focused on the guys that were in there, you would probably, most voters, most people would probably look at the men and think, this isn't a Biden ad. These aren't the, you know, these aren't typically the kind of voters that people tie to Joe Biden, right? And so, mm -hmm. one, it is, you, you know, you see these guys in camo, they're going hunting, <laughs> um, they're talking yeah. uh, about the chip sack. That's not what people, people 
normally think about as Democrats. So one, it shows that this campaign, though they, they didn't make this ad, but that this campaign is going to be focusing on and trying to focus on um, a really diverse coalition, bringing in a bunch of different people like they did in 2020. It's also a part of a series of ads. It's going to be seven figures. They're focusing on union members, their families, and really targeted to those three important states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. These three guys that are in the video that they focus on are going to be part of the group that meets um, in, in, with President Biden today in Saginaw, Michigan. Mm. Um, and this is another example of this Biden campaign leaning into the president and regular people. There was the father and his kids, if you guys remember that, about student loans a while back. The president was at their house. But this is the kind of the same thing, showing people, um, as the campaign aides put it to me and Lemire all the time, um, <laughs> that they want to show this president as someone who is fighting for regular people and that this election is going to kind of come down to that. Despite all the polls and all the things we've been seeing it's, as things have been changing, when we get closer, September, October, November, that's where that contrast is going to be. And President Biden today in Michigan, his remarks are going to be pushing that contrast. The campaign says he'll be hitting Trump on his comments about being open to cutting Medicare and Social Security, something that the president has openly <laughs> negotiated in states of the union with House Republicans about, and that now the leader of their party has been saying that he's open to doing. And so um, lots of contrast happening. We'll be following what he does in Michigan. But these ads and this kind of tenor is going to continue as we head into November. All right, White House correspondent for Politico, Eugene Daniels, thank you very much for bringing that to us, <clears throat> that focus on Michigan, obviously a really important state for Biden to win. The House yesterday took a major step toward potentially banning TikTok over national security concerns. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake reports. For social media giant TikTok, an uncertain future this morning, as a bill calling for the company to split from its Chinese parent company or be shut down, now heads to the Senate. The U.S. House on Wednesday, in a rare and overwhelmingly bipartisan vote, passing the measure that requires TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, to sell the app within six months. Republican Mike Gallagher wrote the bill. What do you say to people who just fundamentally don't understand why the app where they watch silly dance videos is a national security threat? The possibility for dangerous propaganda is too immense to allow one of our foremost adversaries to have this control over what is increasingly becoming the dominant news platform in America. Lawmakers and national security experts have long been concerned with ByteDance's ties to the Chinese Communist Party, which many believe can and does store data from American users, partly because of a national security law that requires Chinese companies to share data and other information with the government. The reason that is valuable to the Chinese Communist Party is that the it begins to allow them to know how to influence Americans. In its annual threat assessment, the U.S. intelligence community says China used TikTok in the 2022 midterms, warning it could do so again in this fall's presidential election. TikTok has repeatedly denied any connections to the Chinese government, with the company's CEO responding to the House vote late Wednesday. We will continue to do all we can, including exercising our legal rights, to protect this amazing platform. Just 65 House members, mostly Democrats, oppose the bill. It's an overly broad bill that I don't think will withstand First Amendment scrutiny. Uh, the, the other issue is that there are a lot of people who make their livelihoods on this. Including creators like J.T. Laborn. It is 100% of our income. Um, it's how I feed my wife and three children. Even some who support a divestment see a double-edged sword in an election year, with more than 20% of American voters using TikTok at least once a day. Cutting out a large group of young voters is not uh, the best known strategy for re-election. So NBC's Garrett Hake reporting on that. Joining us now is one of the Democrats who co-authored the TikTok bill, Congressman Raja Krishna Murthy of Illinois. He's a ranking member of the House Select Committee on China. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us. What, uh, what, what message do you think was sent to the Communist Chinese Party? Why was it important that that message got sent? I think the message was that, look, uh, the American people... Uh, enjoy TikTok, and we in Congress want the platform to continue to operate. But we want ByteDance to divest its vast majority of ownership of TikTok. This was not a ban. It was a divestment bill. And it's really not about TikTok. It's about ByteDance. 
Just so your viewers know, ByteDance is a Chinese company that has 100% ownership of TikTok. And the uh, editor-in-chief of ByteDance is the secretary of the Chinese Communist Party cell embedded at the highest ranks of ByteDance to make sure that all products of ByteDance, including TikTok, adhere to, quote, correct political direction. And so that is yeah. why we are asking for the divestment of TikTok. Well, I mean, they push propaganda. I mean, posts that uh, sow confusion in the United States and undermine America's interests somehow go, uh, go viral. But if you, uh, let's say, decide to post anything on Ouija's or Hong Kong or, or other, other issues about human rights, suddenly uh, those won't go viral. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, they, they won't see the light of day. I'm wondering, um, from what you've heard uh, from your Senate colleagues, do you have hope that they will do the right thing and stop allowing the Communist Chinese Party to spy on Americans, to push propaganda on Americans, and use algorithms uh, to impact our elections negatively? Yes. Uh, we've had many positive conversations. Obviously, we want to respect the process that Leader Schumer has uh, for taking up this bill. But I think there's a lot of interest and I got to say, what TikTok did last week and in, in its lobbying campaigns have really uh, backfired and caused more people to support our bill, um, including in both chambers. Just as an example, on the morning of the vote uh, in the House Energy and Commerce Committee to take up this bill, uh, TikTok sent out a push uh, notification and pop up on millions of users' phones uh, using geolocation data of minor children to get them to call their members of Congress in order to continue uh, accessing content on TikTok. These minor children flooded our office with offices with phone calls and asked questions like, what's a congressman? What is Congress? One person said, um, one person impersonated uh, a member of Congress's son to be able to get his TikTok back. And this type of influence campaign is exactly what this bill was intended to address and what got people so upset about TikTok. Congressman, good morning. For all the valid criticisms you make of TikTok, and we've all seen them all, we're aware of them, what do you make of the argument about the First Amendment? We're hearing from many of your progressive colleagues there who voted against this bill, though it did pass overwhelmingly on a bipartisan basis, that this will not pass scrutiny, that this could be a 9-0 vote in the Supreme Court if it makes it up that high on First Amendment grounds. Um, I take their concerns seriously. Uh, about half the Progressive Caucus ended up voting for this bill. And the reason why is simple. They know there's no First Amendment right to espion espionage or First Amendment right to harm our national security. The First Amendment covers speech, not conduct, and certainly not uh, anybody's right, including the Chinese Communist Party's, uh, uh, to somehow use the platform to do harm to Americans. And so I think that is why working with the Biden administration, we came up with language that was not a ban, but rather a, div a divestment to ensure that we address the legitimate First Amendment rights and concerns of users, while at the same time addressing our national security concerns. So, Congressman, though, to that point, we've certainly heard op the opposition suggest it's not just you know, being dubious of some of the national security concerns, raising awareness about the First Amendment, but just also saying this is unprecedented, saying that this is a step that the Congress has never taken before. Can, what is your response to that? Do they feel like this could be the beginning of a slippery slope? This is not without precedent. That's incorrect. The best example is the LGBTQ app Grindr. Grindr was owned by a Chinese company, and once it became clear that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, had access to sensitive data about LGBTQ members of the U.S. government and military, they were forced to divest. They did so very quickly because the app is, was very valuable, much like TikTok, and there was no disruption to users. And that's what we would expect in this case as well. All right, Democratic Congressman Roger Krishnamoorthy of Illinois. We will continue this conversation. Lots of debate around it. We appreciate you coming on this morning. Thank you. All right, the House yesterday overwhelmingly passed a bill that could lead to a ban of TikTok in the United States. Lawmakers in favor of the legislation say 
Its goal is solely to divest the popular social media platform from its Chinese parent company. Opponents say it's a form of censorship. Moments ago, former Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin revealed this to CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin. It's a great business, and I'm going to put together a group to buy TikTok. The issue is all about the technology. This needs to be controlled by U.S. Let me business. ask you a very... And the co-anchor of Squawk Box joins us now. This uh, story gets stranger Keeps by going. the moment. Tell us about it, Andrew. Uh, a real turn of events. Obviously, we saw yesterday the House uh, deciding to effectively force what they would describe as the divestment of TikTok. Some saying it's a full on ban because realistically, the Chinese government may not allow the sale of TikTok to a U.S. buyer. Uh, and the prospect that it would have to be done in six months may make it almost impossible uh, both to find a buyer and a buyer to, to be able to put the technology together to make it all work. This morning, um, in what turned out to be a, a breaking news moment, uh, the former secretary of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, telling us that he is prepared to put together a, a, a group and is, in fact, already in the process of trying to put that a group together, um, trying to become a white knight, if you will, uh, and believes strongly that he can actually work perhaps with the Chinese government uh, and that they would accept him as a potential buyer. Uh, we will see about what happens now, but this is uh, invariably going to be even more politicized than it was uh, just 24 hours ago. Of course, yeah. we still are waiting on the Senate. That will be the next step in all of this anyway. Uh, you know, the House's bill unto itself is going to sit there, and it's unclear, actually, whether the Senate's really even going to take this up. Um, and then, of course, there's a question of, is it really a national security threat or not? Yeah. Um, and we'll see. And the answer to that is yes, according to me. But, but uh, strange which, bedfellows. That, so that, the, that, the, the strange it, bedfellows yeah. are yeah. remarkable because, of course, the uh, President Trump, former President Trump, has said that he— didn't want to uh, effectively ban TikTok, even though he right. was the one with with the Treasury right. Secretary because who tried to ban it the because first time. A billionaire, because a billionaire came into Mar-a-Lago and told him not to. It's pretty simple. Well, even Steve Bannon clear. is I, saying that. I will say, I you know, when we spoke to former President Trump on Monday, I asked him directly yeah. about whether Jeffrey Yass, who has a big stake in TikTok uh, and had met with yeah. the president, had asked him about that. And he very... Um, Clearly, clearly said, and you. you could decide yes. whether you believe him or not, yeah. but he said no. no he said we had no yeah. conversation about this yeah. whatsoever. And in fact, his view is yeah. that if you uh, get rid of TikTok, it's going to make Facebook more powerful. And he has a view that Facebook, as he likes to say, is, quote, the enemy of the people, though it's owned by the an enemy of the people. So, yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, he came on he your tried. show and he lied. Um, this is. Let's bring in right now criminal defense attorney and former Watergate prosecutor John Sell. Mr. Sell, thanks so much for being with us. What do you expect to hear from the from uh, these hearings today? And does Donald Trump have a chance uh, to have this case dismissed? Oh, I think he has zero chance of having the case dismissed. The Presidential Records Act was passed after Watergate, which I had a small part in prosecuting. Uh, it basically said the records apply, uh, belong to the American people. They do not belong to the president once he leaves office. And it's absurd to think that he could take nuclear secrets and bring them back to Mar-a-Lago and store them in the basement and uh, the ballroom. And the, the second argument about the statute being vague, there are a number of people who are serving, have served prison terms. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump has argued that this law applies to traitors uh, and people like that, that's could, but it's been used countless times against people who take records and retain them. And that's what he's charged with, unlawfully retaining records that don't even have to be classified. So both of his arguments are going to fail. And I think Judge Cannon is going to do the right thing. All right. So, John, you believe that it's not going to be dismissed. But do you think there's a chance that whether it's today's proceeding plays a role or not, that further delays could occur in this trial, which would push it beyond Election Day? Well, delays occur in every trial. And in fairness, every criminal defense lawyer, including me, whenever we make motions, delays come with it. So the answer is yes. I think that this case will not be tried before the election. And I think that the Trump team saying they're ready in August, what they're just trying to do is to be able to say to Judge Shutkin, oh, we can't go to trial. We have a case set before Judge Cannon, and they're going to play one against the other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to succeed in this case. 
criminal defense attorney and former Watergate prosecutor, John Sale, thank you so much uh, for being on the show this morning.